Hi everyone, this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of echinococcosis, which can be an often unrecognized and unknown infection from stray dogs, wild dogs, and coyotes. So we're going to discuss the signs and symptoms in this lesson and why those signs and symptoms occur. So echinococcosis is a zoonotic infection, meaning it comes from animals, and it's caused by echinococcus species. Now echinococcus is a cestode or a tapeworm, and infection with echinococcus tapeworms is not going to be like other tapeworm infections where a tapeworm would stay in the gastrointestinal system. Echinococcus tapeworms can infect other parts of the body. They can spread throughout the body and infect the liver and lungs to cause cysts in the liver and lungs, and they can also infect the brain in some cases, leading to cysts in the brain. We'll discuss all that when we talk about the signs and symptoms later. Now there's multiple species of echinococcus, and the one we're going to focus on is echinococcus granulosus. This one more specifically will cause what we call hydatidosis or hydatid disease, and it's going to mostly affect the liver, or it's going to cause cysts in the liver. It can cause cysts in the lungs as well and in the brain, but to a lesser extent. Now humans can get infected by echinococcus tapeworms via accidental ingestion of parasite eggs from dog feces. Again, we mentioned the fact that it's often going to be stray, wild dogs or coyotes, and sometimes even foxes as well. Now echinococcosis infections can occur globally, they can occur worldwide, but they're most often going to occur in more rural communities or communities with guard dogs and herding dogs. So anywhere where there are more wild dogs or dogs that are let loose that can themselves be infected by echinococcosis and then bring it back to humans. So we can see it in more areas with herding dogs, for instance. And what's important with regards to echinococcosis is that it can often be asymptomatic for months to years. So asymptomatic means that there's no symptoms at all. We may have been infected by this particular tapeworm. It could have spread to the liver. It could have caused a cyst, but it's not presenting any symptoms yet. So what we can see is that the cyst itself, once it gets into a certain area like the liver or the lungs, it can grow one to five centimeters per year. And it can often go unrecognized and undiagnosed for up to 15 years. Once it has grown large enough, or if there's multiple cysts, which can occur in roughly 20 to 40 percent of cases, the other are going to be singular cysts or just one cyst. Once an individual cyst or multiple cysts have grown too large, they can lead to signs and symptoms. And we'll discuss those signs and symptoms in the next upcoming slides. So we're first going to talk about the signs and symptoms of having a echinococcosis cyst in the liver, and this would be liver hydatidosis. So this is where we have a liver cyst. So some of the first signs and symptoms of liver hydatidosis is abdominal pain. So you can imagine that if you've got a cyst in your liver and it starts to grow, it can start to cause issues. It can start to cause pain depending on the location. This may actually be one of the first symptoms, especially of a cyst in the liver. And what we will see is that it's going to be right upper quadrant pain. So if we were to look at a patient, we break up their abdomen into four quadrants. So here's the right side of the patient, here's the left side of the patient. So this would be the right upper quadrant in this area here. And this is where the liver is located. So if we have a cyst in the liver, it's growing and it's expanding, it starts to impinge on other structures in that area, we can have right upper quadrant pain. We can also see decreased appetite as well. This may also be an early symptom, and depending on the location of the cyst, we may see early satiety as well. Early satiety is getting full quicker. So you might feel hungry, then you go eat, and then you get full very quickly. And in some cases, we may see nausea and vomiting as well. So why might some of these signs and symptoms be occurring? Well, if we were to look at this image here, we can see the stomach in this location here, but we can also see the liver. So it depends on where that cyst may be in the liver. If the cyst is perhaps in a portion of the liver that is closer to the stomach and that cyst starts to grow and grow and expand, it can start to impinge or push on the stomach. So a decreased appetite, that early satiety, and even nausea and vomiting can be due to pressure on extrahepatic structures. Extrahepatic means that it's structures outside of the liver, and one of those could be the stomach depending on the location of the cyst. So we can see decreased appetite, early satiety, or getting full quicker, and sometimes nausea and vomiting. Some other signs and symptoms of having an echinococcosis cyst in the liver includes what we call hepatomegaly. So hepatomegaly is 
The term for an enlarged liver, hepato, refers to the liver, and megaly means enlarged, so it's an enlarged liver. So again, if we have that cyst, it's growing one to five centimeters per year, and you've had it for many years, it can become so large that the liver itself may start to expand and become larger itself. This can lead to hepatomegaly, so we may see a large mass like this, again, in the right upper quadrant. So again, it's a right upper quadrant mass, so if you'd actually touch in around the edge of the rib cage on the near the right upper quadrant, you can feel a mass sort of protruding out. This is again going to be due to that enlarging cyst. And we can also see abdominal distension in patients with echinococcosis cysts in the liver. So we can have an enlarged abdomen. So it's an overall enlargement of the abdomen. And we may see this also with ascites or having fluid in the abdomen. So we'll discuss the reason why that is here in a moment. Some other findings can include biliary obstruction. So if we're to look at the liver, inside the liver we have intrahepatic biliary ducts. So bile gets produced by the liver. These ducts eventually coalesce into the right and left hepatic ducts. They join up with the cystic duct. Some of the bile will go into the gallbladder for concentration, and then it will ultimately be released through the common bile duct and into the duodenum or the first part of the small intestine. Now, if we were to have a cyst or multiple cysts in the liver, you can imagine that some of these cysts could be pushing on some of these biliary ducts. And that would prevent bile from being excreted to the gallbladder or out into the small intestine. So you'd have a biliary obstruction, you'd have a buildup of bile. So again, a cystic mass can impinge on those biliary ducts, and then that can lead to signs and symptoms of biliary obstruction. Some of these include jaundice or a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. We'll discuss that here in a moment. It can also lead to diffuse itching sensation or diffuse pruritus. So you might be wondering why that occurs. The reason is because bile salts, instead of them being excreted into the small intestine, they get built up and they start to spill out into the blood of the patient and they can elicit an itching sensation. So you might feel itchy around different parts of your body. So those are some of the signs and symptoms of biliary obstruction. As mentioned just a moment ago, we can all see jaundice or that yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. This is going to be due to increased bilirubin in the blood. So bilirubin actually comes from the breakdown of red blood cells. So a red blood cell gets broken down into its component parts. One of them is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin ultimately gets broken down into heme, and then heme then gets broken down into bilirubin. Bilirubin is going to be yellowish colored, so it's going to lead to a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes because it binds to elastin in the whites of the eyes and in the skin. So we can see images like this, jaundice of the skin, and if it's the whites of the eyes, we call it scleral icterus. And we mentioned before that it can be due to biliary obstruction, but it can also be due to the next complication, and that is cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is going to be end-stage liver disease. You can imagine that if you have that cyst and it keeps growing, or if you have multiple cysts especially, the architecture of the liver starts to become impacted. So some of the cells of the liver become damaged, and ultimately, if this continues for long periods of time, we can get continuous damage to the liver, which then leads to scarring, and that is cirrhosis ultimately. So once we've got enough scarring of the liver tissue, and then there's less functional liver tissue than is needed, then we have end-stage liver disease. So again, this is going to be due to prolonged or long-term damage due to those growing cysts. And it can occur with one cyst, but it can be more likely to occur with multiple cysts. If you've got multiple cysts throughout the liver and they continue to grow and grow over time, that can lead to damage to the liver and then ultimately scarring. And we can also see anaphylaxis occurring. Now, anaphylaxis can occur not only in cysts in the liver, but they can also occur in the lungs as well. And anaphylaxis has to do with the rupturing of cysts. So if one cyst ruptures or multiple cysts rupture, and there's a spilling out of these echinococcus organisms into the blood, this can lead to a host immune response to those echinococcus organisms. So if we were to have anaphylaxis, if there's a rupturing of one of those cysts, it's going to lead to sudden onset of symptoms. So that's going to be different than the symptoms we talked about before, where they're kind of slow at starting. But with regards to anaphylaxis, it's going to be a sudden onset. If there's a sudden rupturing of a cyst either spontaneously or due to injury. So if you had cysts in the liver 
and there was some injury to the right upper quadrant or right directly on the liver, that could burst one of those cysts leading to anaphylaxis in some cases. This is going to be IgE mediated, so immunoglobulin E, this is a type of antibody. And this can lead to hives, so we can have itching hives around the body, mucous membrane swelling, so we can have swollen tongue, so we can see angioedema. This can be very severe because if the tongue becomes so swollen, it can occlude the airway, so you can have difficulty breathing, and then you can see flushing as well. And moving on to lung hydatidosis, or having a lung cyst in echinococcosis infections. Some of the signs and symptoms of cysts in the lungs include chest pain. So again, it depends on where these cysts might be residing in the lung. If it's affecting the pleura, some of the lining of the lung, it can lead to pleuritic chest pain. So you can have sharp chest pain, especially when taking a deep breath in. We may see discomfort. So if it's in any other area, we may just have some discomfort or aching pain in the chest. And again, this is going to occur after generally quite a long period of time as that cyst has grown. And again, it depends on the location of the cyst. We can also see cough as well. So it's going to be a chronic cough. Now, a chronic cough is going to be a cough that lasts for eight weeks or longer. Now, some of the causes of a chronic cough include smoking, asthma, it could be COPD. We could see it with gastroesophageal reflux disease, and we can also see it with certain medications like ACE inhibitors. But interestingly, echinococcus infections that involve the lung are actually one of the infectious causes of a chronic cough. Most of the time, the cough's going to be a dry cough. The patient's not going to be coughing up any phlegm. But in some cases, depending on where that cyst is residing in the lung, we may see hemoptysis or a coughing up of blood. And then we can also see dyspnea as well. Dyspnea is going to be a shortness of breath. So that can occur also in patients with echinococcosis with lung involvement. This is often going to be due to structural changes. So some of the species of echinococcus can lead to structural damage to the lung. So there may be permanent structural damage to the lung that can lead to chronic dyspnea or chronic shortness of breath. So it depends on what species is causing infection and the location of the cyst in the lung. Now, we can also see the brain being involved in echinococcosis as well. This would be cerebral echinococcosis or cerebral cystic echinococcosis. So there's different terms for this. So this is going to be the most rare form. It's going to occur in less than 2% of patients. And a lot of times these cysts can grow and enlarge in the brain and they're going to act like a brain mass or a brain tumor in that they're going to lead to an increased intracranial pressure or ICP. And increased intracranial pressure is going to lead to mass effects. It's going to lead to particular findings, including a headache. So the headache, again, is going to be due to a mass effect in the brain. And the headache can either be a tension headache, so a band across the head, or it can be a migraine, unilateral pounding headache. We can also see nausea and vomiting as well. So again, that's going to be due to increased intracranial pressure that can lead to nausea and vomiting. And then we can also see papilledema as well. So if we're to take a ophthalmoscope and look at the back of the eye, we can see papilledema or optic disc swelling. So you can see in this image here, the optic disc is swollen and you can see the arteries sort of being distorted by that swelling. And again, that's also due to increased ICP. And then if, again, depending on the location in the brain, we may see other focal neurological defects, for instance. So these are going to be some of the main signs and symptoms of cerebral involvement, but we may also see some other neurological issues as well. Please check out my full lesson on echinococcosis if you want more information on the pathophysiology of the condition, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.